Acapulco, Mexico. This is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a returning guest all, all the way over there on my left, on your right, uh, Bob Podolsky. He was on quite a while ago talking about Octologs, which was quite interesting. Uh, and one of the interesting things about it was I was kind of saying, he was saying all these interesting things about it. And I said, well, what's some examples of it? And he didn't really have too many, but they've actually now started a number of octologues. And actually, Bob's pretty much moved down here to Mexico, as far as I can tell. And uh, he's actually working with Michael Nimitz, who's actually a neighbor of mine here. Uh, it's actually an all anarchist neighborhood up here, up in the hills. Uh, and uh, he's started the octologues. We're gonna get into what they're doing. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll just start, let's start with you, Bob, and just sort of remind us a little bit about the whole concept of this octologue and holomat. Okay. I got the concept originally from John David Garcia, whom I met in 1984, and he had just completed writing of a book called Creative Transformation. And I met him when he gave a workshop in Eugene, Oregon, which I attended, and it opened my eyes to a lot of things, not the least of which was the importance of the subject of ethics. I had thought that ethics were just a bunch of rules that people made up. And I had thought that they were pretty trivial because one could pick an ethic for oneself arbitrarily. I didn't know then that not all, all ethics are created equal. An ethic is nothing but a value that describes what you want more of and a belief system that tells you how to get it. And when the belief system yields the results that you hope for, the ethic is valid and if they don't, which most ethics are not valid, then the ethic is not valid because you follow the belief system, you don't get the results of what you value. So John David pointed out to me the importance of ethics and how it affects groups. And when I met him in 84, he had for three years been doing research on how groups ethically interact and how do they maximize creativity. And the reason he picked out creativity as the thing to be maximized is because creativity is the logical equivalent of truth, awareness, and love. Because if any one of those increases, they're all increased. And if any one of them diminishes or is limited, they're all limited or diminished. So they're logically equivalent. Creativity is a handy handle by which to group those subjects. And we wanted to know what does one do in a group to maximize creativity and with it, ethics? How do you get an ethical society or an ethical group? And uh, we spent the next 17 years exploring that experimentally. And we found out that a group is the most creative and ethical when there are about eight people in the group. Uh, that's why we call such groups octologues. It's like a dialogue, but for eight people. So an octologue isn't just a random group of eight, like a committee. An octologue is a group committed to an ethical purpose, first of all. And the group is typically seven to nine people, though it always starts out with just one or two and grows up to be eight or nine people. And the group has a commitment to an ethical purpose. And not all purposes are ethical, obviously because they don't all contribute to truth, awareness, love, and creativity. And it turns out that when you maximize truth, awareness, love, and creativity as a byproduct, you also get peace, and you get uh, prosperity. prosperity, and you get, mm -hmm. you get uh, freedom as byproducts. So instead of trying to maximize freedom, which if you go at it straight on, doesn't work very well, uh, and there are many examples of that. But if you uh, instead maximize truth, awareness, love, and creativity, you in fact get more freedom, you get more of everything you value. Now if I said to someone, what would it mean to you to live the life you've always wanted? Now I realize that for those living here in Acapulco, I there's a lot of people here living the life they always wanted, but <clears throat> 
in most of the world, people are not living the life they want to live. They are miserable. 90% of people in the United States, for example, hate their job. There's been polls done on this. Uh, why do they hate their job? Well, usually, either directly or indirectly, because they're working in a hierarchy and they have a boss. And the boss tells them what to do, where to do, when to do it, how to do it, what to wear while they're doing it, whether they can take a potty break, how much they're paid, and through that, what kind of house they live in, what kind of car they drive, what kind of schools their kids go to, what kind of vacations they take, all the above. That's having a boss. And most people don't like that. Most people want to be in charge of those things themselves. The Octolog allows people to do that. So a group, if you formed an Octolog as a business, and that's not the only thing you can form with an octolog. You could have a charity, a school, any kind of ethical organization. But if it's a business, it turns out we had the means to make that business maximally creative. And that's a good thing because everything we love in life, everything comes from some kind of creativity. You're smoking a cigarette. Somebody invented the cigarette. That's a creativity. Thank you. Uh -huh. You're enjoying it. <laughs> Great, okay? My point is that even the design of these chairs that we're sitting in involve creativity. Certainly the invention of all this equipment that you have for recording Anarchast, more creativity. So maximizing creativity creates many opportunities and much prosperity. And that's what we want to see happen worldwide instead of what is happening, which is being controlled by a bunch of psychopathic control freaks who are sitting at the tops of big hierarchies. Hierarchy is not a necessary or natural part of the world. Uh, there are hierarchies that are, but they're very specific. For example, the system by which we distinguish different classes of creatures. Okay, there's a whole hierarchy of life. You know, we look at, okay, we've got microbes at one end of the spectrum and humans at the other, and all the other critters in between, it's hierarchic only on paper because we don't have animals bossing each other around for the most part. The whole idea of hierarchy is based on the notion that some people have a right to rule other people. That kind of sucks. <laughs> it is the cause of many, many, many unhappy events and possibilities and we don't have to settle for that. We are at a point in the history of humanity and the evolution of humanity where we are now equipped to change all of that. But it's going to require us to abandon hierarchies and form groups which are not top-down and they're not bottom-up. They start in the middle and expand horizontally where no one is someone else's boss. We know how to do that now. A lot of the people who are the audience for this program are people who have been seeking. They've been looking, 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 looking for the answer to how are we going to break out of this system where the world is run by psychopaths. Well, guess what? We don't have to seek anymore. We've found it. We recognize it, and we're teaching it. This is what the Octolog is all about. This is what our group here is all about. And this is why I say that Anarchapulco is a very important event. But here, those of us who are here physically, we have Anarchapulco 24-7-365. We are living it and loving it. And it's exciting. And the benefits are many, many, many different kinds of benefits none of which has a real downside, except for one thing. And that is, we have to have a mind that's open enough to encompass this new technology, and we have to be entrepreneurial enough or go-getters enough to actually say, I'm going to do it. And that's why I want the world to know that this man is a hero in my book, because he grasped the idea visualized its possible application, and took action. And now we have the first Octolog is present here in Acapulco. 
And that's a big part of why I'm here. I came down here from Arizona uh, mainly because Michael Nimitz has changed the culture here in a profound way in a way that I have been thinking about and talking about for 32 years and finally have found a home for it. Yeah, that's interesting because um, in our first interview, uh, I'm, I'm not a very theoretical thinker. I, I, I need examples of stuff. Uh, you can come up with all these concepts and, you know, I'm not very smart. I went to public school, government run school. So, yeah, so, did I. Uh, so I need examples of stuff. So in our first interview, I was mostly confused. Uh, to, to be honest, and I think you even said you didn't quite grasp it all either. But what you just said is very interesting. I, I'm getting a better idea of what you're talking about now. And one of the big things that a lot of uh, the, what you call anarcho-communists uh, differ quite a bit from the more what we call ourselves anarcho-capitalists. We're more for, yeah, business is good, making money is fine, money is not evil, it's just a transfer of value from people, you're creating value for other people. But they have a real issue with hierarchy, and that's one thing that I always hear from the anarcho-communists is hierarchy is bad. And I'm like, well, how are you going to do things? You can't have a business without some sort of hierarchy, but what you're saying is, if you structure it a certain way with a, with a certain amount of people, and I, I totally understand that because if it gets up to thousands of people, it's all going to fall apart, right? Because everyone's got their own motivations and stuff like that. But if it's a small enough, possibly, that you can do things. And that's very interesting. There's actually, I don't know if you guys saw, uh, this week there was a, a Marxist restaurant up in the U.S. <laughs> that shut down because it was taking like half an hour to get your food. Uh, and it was just sandwiches. And all the complaints were like, you couldn't tip the waiters because they don't believe in, you know, all that kind of stuff. So the waiter, waiters were really bad at the service. Uh, the service was all slow because they didn't really care. There was no motivation to really do anything. And they shut down. Uh, so they were trying to, but it was all worker-owned. So that was the thing, right? So they have this concept, it all has to be worker-owned. But what I've seen of most worker-owned organizations is it all, almost always falls apart but it's possibly because they're not doing it how you're saying to do it. So that's very interesting. So Michael, you watched the interview with Bob and you got very interested in it uh, and you decided to take action. Why don't you describe what you did? Well, just going back to the circumstances, you know, I did watch the Anarchast and I thought, wow, this, is, this has got a, a, some real uh, ramifications that I think I'm interested in. I, I've ran, you know, I've ran construction projects and done project management for quite a few years. And so I've always been interested in, you know, how to do things better. And so this to me looked like, hey, this is a very efficient organization. I, I like this structure. And, and, you know, and I also like the idea of not having any, any rulers, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so with that said, you know, Anarchopoco came along and of course I went to Bob and I said, you know, I saw your interview and I really liked what you had to say. And, you know, I'd like to learn more. So Bob had a workshop. I went through that workshop. You know, I was really excited about it. I wanted uh, us to get, get rolling on it, you know. Because another thing that we've got here in, in Acapulco is we've, we've got a lot of smart people. You know, a lot of smart people that, that have uh, a great deal of, of ethical drive as well. Or, or, uh, and so, you know, combining those two together, I thought, wow, we're, we're really going to come up with something good. Uh, you know, things transpired that uh, it kind of got slowed down, other, other priorities took place. But uh, a few months ago, Bob called me on the, on the, on the phone or on the Skype, uh, Skype and said, hey, what's, what's going on? And I said, well, Bob, I've, you know, I've had other priorities. So he said, well, are you still interested in Octolog? And I said, yeah, yeah, I am. Matter of fact, and you know, we've got the people here. I just need to organize them, and so that's when we decided to start meeting on this on this subject. And so uh, now it's a few months later. We've actually established the Octolog, and we're really starting to see. With uh, you know, currently we have six people of the eight uh, designated, and being that each person is adding something to it and, and getting grasping the understanding of it, we're really starting to see some real possibilities, not just with getting things done or being creative, but also impacting the individual's, you know, uh, self-image, uh, being able to impact things like if, if you were to take an octolog and put it in the family environment, what that would mean for, like, peaceful parenting, 
there's, there's just all kinds of applications that can come about that that could be part of a group. But just you know what we're doing here is you know essentially just trying to establish this community and being the core of making this community you know a strong community is what we started with as a goal. But it's already starting to to grow beyond that. You know where we're going to look into business opportunities. We're going to look into all kinds of different things. I don't want to mention too many of them because, uh, you know, we're just getting started. But, uh, you know, the future is really bright. And then when you take that out and you expand that out to where octologues are pro proliferating all over the world, these kinds of groups with the ethical uh, you know, basis for what's going on, it essentially eliminates all the things that we fear, you know, the government, the psychopaths, all that kind of thing, because because the group is working together, and because they're relying on the contract between each other, you can essentially find the people that are unethical and get rid of them. You know, and so as as these things start to to grow, you're dealing with ethical people. You're not dealing with psychopaths. If know? nothing else, it's a sorting mechanism. If someone joins an octologue and attempts to get the octologue to do something unethical, they're going to be called on it right away because there are seven other people who understand the ethics, they understand its application, they understand the principles that come out of the basic definitions, and they're going to be saying, ah, ah, sorry, we're not going to do that. Because one of the constraints in an octologue is we only make unanimous decisions. If it isn't unanimous, it is not an octologue decision. Well, that gives everyone in the group the power to veto anything they think is unethical. And then, if someone proposes something and someone objects to it, you have discussion. And the discussion will go on until either the issue is resolved or the group decides, we can't resolve this, we're going to not act on that. That decision ain't going to happen. Oh, we, we, could, uh, we could go down on the street and... Uh, uh, stop people at random and steal their money. Oh, well, you know, that's what the bandits do out there all the time. We might, someone might propose doing something like that, and instantly, seven other people are going to say, nah, come on, we don't want to do that, that's not ethical. And it ain't going forward unless everyone agrees. And that's one of the powerful things about it, because in a small group, seven to nine people typically, you could have ethical decisions where unethical decisions get eliminated very quickly, very quickly. So what happens when a psychopath attempts to infiltrate such a group? Well, they're instantly recognized for what they are, and they don't get to be influential the way they are in other organizations. Instead, you're out of here, and in an octologue, the octologue can actually expel a member if the rest of them decide unanimously to do so. So if you've got someone who's antithetical to the, to the ethics, they're not around for long. And when the whole world is based on octologues and holomats, a holomat is just a contract between a number of octologues, when you have that going on worldwide, what's going to happen to the psychopaths? They're not going to have a home. They're not going to, have, they're not going to be able to approach a significant organization that, that uh, is influential in the world and get them to do their bidding because, oh my gosh, you got all these people who understand the ethics and they won't put up with it. I wouldn't put up with it, would you? I don't think so. No, of course not. But um, one, one question I have is uh, what's the scaling on these sort of things? So if you have eight people and they come up with a restaurant idea or something mm -hmm. and it does really well and okay, we want to open 50 different restaurants, well, you can't just have eight people run all 50 restaurants. So right. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. <clears throat> we have a, a method for that. Within an octologue, typically, once the group settles in, I mean, you know, who, 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 who's in this group, who's not, and you, you get clear about what your goals are, then usually you form a written agreement as to those things. Here's what we're doing, here's our purpose, here's our ethical commitment, and here's how we're going to relate to each other. For example, we're going to give each other honest feedback about how we experience each other. That's usually part of the contract. And unanimous decisions. Okay, <clears throat> now we want to expand beyond 
what we eight can handle. No big deal. We form another group of eight, and we form an ethical contract between the two groups to work together towards some particular purpose, which is usually an outgrowth of the purpose of the pre-existing octologue. This group, two or more octologues in an ethical contract, we call a holomat. The name is a short for holotropic matrix. And all that means is that there is a tendency in this group for all of the important information that is available anywhere in the group to be available everywhere in the group, like a holograph. Okay, so now we've got a holomat. How big can you make a holomat? There is no limit to how big you can make a holomat. You could have a billion people in a holomat because every one of them is in an octologue that has an ethical purpose, an ethical commitment, ethical relationships between the members, and through that, same dynamic, ethical relationships with all the other octologues that are part of the holomat. We see that this can be done. A big one has never been done. Well, how do we know it will work? Well, how do you know that 2 plus 2 is 4? How do you know that S equals 1 half GT squared applies to any falling object? <laughs> the distance it falls is uh, 16 times T squared, where T is in seconds. You can predict the outcome. We understand the mechanism. You can predict the outcome. You don't have to create all the possible cases in order to say we have a principle that works generally and we can apply it anywhere, anytime. So even though we've not yet built uh, a holomat of a million people, we know it can be done because we can take a group of eight and make that work. We can have two groups of eight, contract that works, and maintain the standards and ethics of the overall group. Well, you can't say that about any other kind of group. You can't say that about any hierarchy. Absolutely isn't going to work. In a hierarchy, there are always people who have power over others. There will always have people in a hierarchy who can sway the group to do what they want them to do because they are able to influence the group in ways that, a, that an octologue would not permit. We know this for a fact. We did a lot of experiments. John David Garcia and I worked together for 17 years. He had already been at it for three years when I met him. So we've devised a whole bunch of tools that any group can use to form an octologue or a holomat. And we want to get those tools out in the public eye so that everyone has access to them, everyone can use them. It's an open source process in that sense. We give away a lot of information. Now, do we give away everything? No. We also function as a business. Certain kinds of information we sell. If I have to put time into developing relationships with a group of people and demonstrating for them that these principles work, well, I'm putting energy out. I expect to be compensated. So I charge for the workshops but not for the raw information, not for the basic stuff. And in fact, the book, my most recent book, Flourish, is available in PDF form for the asking. I don't charge, I, I send it off to anyone who asks for it by email uh, in a PDF file, and I'm glad to do it. And then occasionally someone will say, well, why do you charge for your workshops? Well, let's see, uh, I don't get free food, I don't get free room and board. Uh, you don't have to explain why you charge uh, here. <laughs> uh, there are people for whom I do have to explain it. Uh, and, and I realize that not, not many of your audience are like that. Right. But the anarcho-communists would ask that for sure. It, it, those people who, who ask that kind of question or who bring up that kind of objection are people who were not adequately nurtured as infants. <laughs> and I can show the correlation one to one. This is a, a perfect mapping. You show me someone who was not adequately nurtured as an infant, and I'll show you a socialist or a communist when they get to be adults. It's cause and effect. Two plus two, it's always four. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it because it makes no logical sense why they think, believe the things they do, so it must be something that happened to them or they have no soul or something. They had well, a bad experience. But, yeah. but truthfully, these are all things that can be solved, and this is also part of the octologue is that the, the 
self-improvement that you can realize from having the feedback of seven other people about ideas that you have, you can bounce ideas that are crazy off people and, they, and, and they're going to come back to you with, you know, with some rational feedback, which, you know, uh, we can throw anything at. So these things are not just for ANCAPs or, you know, people that are freedom-minded. This Octolog is for anybody that wants to get anything done. They, we're just saying that this is a process that's going to help you get where you want to go. So we could we could put uh, you know flat earth uh, flat earthers with with uh, sphere earthers, and and between the between them they're going to find out you know they're going to find out a lot about what each side is is coming together with, and this is also about uh, you know teaching people how to relate to each other, you know so that you're going to have circumstances where people are at uh, at odds about their beliefs. The octolog is a way to solve that. Let me, so add, let me ask something to that. Uh, one of the workshops that we are prepared to give, which I've actually given elsewhere, is called the Soul Bonding Workshop. And what this addresses is the fact that who we are as adults is formed in the first five years of our lives. And unfortunately, most mothers and fathers, especially mothers, do not know what good parenting is ahead of time. And so they make a lot of mistakes. And while they may be perfectly well-intended, a lot of us get emotionally distorted as a result of those early experiences. We now know what kind of early experiences cause what kinds of, of uh, trauma, emotional trauma, and what effects that have, has on, on the behavior of people. And so from someone's behavior, we can backtrack and say, aha, here is a communist. He didn't get nurtured when he was an infant. Here is uh, a, a violent person. Oh, well, he experienced violence as a child. That's how we learn violence. If we eliminated violence to children, we would eliminate violence throughout the world. We wouldn't have wars. We wouldn't be able to teach someone to pick up a gun, travel halfway around the world, and kill strangers. No one would do it because they weren't subject to violence as infants. We know these correlations now, and I have developed an educational process. This is the process I call soul bonding, which is a lot like group therapy or group psychotherapy, except it's not run on a clinical model, it's an educational model, which means it's not controllable or regulatable by the cartels that control professional psychology and such things. And it, it encompasses six different therapeutic modalities that are very powerful, very effective, and very little used in, in academic environments. In other words, if someone goes to school and becomes a therapist, and they come out of school and they think they're ready to do therapy with people, generally they're not. Because a good therapist is only has to start with a person who's had a lot of therapy themselves, where they understand what events in their childhood, which they then remember, had what effects on who they are as adults. When you know that about yourself, you're in control of your future in ways that you cannot be when you are conditioned by childhood and don't know that you have been. So we know now how to recognize the signs and symptoms of those early traumas. And for most people, unfortunately not including psychopaths, because there's no effective therapy for psychopaths, we have to have other means to deal with them. But the fact is that for most people, we can recognize the early traumas, we can undo the harmful effects. It does take some will and determination on the part of the person who's going to change. Well, I'm a good example of change. If you had met me before I was 32 years old, you would not have wanted to be friends with me. I would not, today, me today, I would not want to be friends with the guy I was when I was 30 because I've outgrown some of the really terrible habits that I had prior to that. Well, I had 10 years of therapy, hammer and tongs. I really worked on myself and I eliminated many of the traits that separated me from people as a young man. You know, people used to look at, at my body and say, are you angry? Because I 
head, shoulders like this. And I thought I was relaxed and reasonable. Angry, not me, I'm reasonable. <clears throat> just uncomfortable just to go into that posture today. But that was habitual back then. And I would deny being angry, I would deny being afraid, because those feelings were forbidden in my family when I was a child. Well, you can't go through life and, and, and have the life you really want if you're pretending not to be angry and pretending not to be afraid. I had to give that up. When I did, I went from being someone that hardly anyone trusted to being someone that almost everyone does trust. I didn't set out to have that effect, but it did. Because I became honest with myself, honest with my friends. For the first time, I started having real friends. I was not a good friend to the people that thought I was their friend prior to that because a big piece of who I was was hidden from them and, more importantly, from me. So if you want to find out who you really are, come to a soul bonding workshop and begin the process of finding out or continue the process for those who have already done some of that exploration. We're going to have not only workshops in that field, we're going to have an ongoing training to teach people to do the work that I know how to do. I want everyone to know how to do it. And you don't have to have a degree, you don't have to go to college, you don't have to be part of that psychological cartel that controls that industry. And in fact, the tools that you'll learn are much more effective than most of the tools used in that widely accepted traditional academic environment. The really creative work in that field is done out on the fringes by the people that those in academia look down their noses at them and say, oh, you're doing alternative therapy. Huh. Like they're sneering at it. Well, they're sneering at it because they don't know how to do it and it's better than anything they know how to do. And we can make all of that available. And that's part of the octologue strategy is that if one person in an octologue has even a grasp of a few of those tools, then when conflict arises in the group, and it always will, sooner or later, then you have someone present who says, aha, I recognize what's happening. You have some unfinished business from around the age of two, for example, or three, or up to five. You have some unfinished business that needs uh, taken care of. Are you willing to participate in an experiment right here and now? If they are, then you have the tools necessary to give them the opportunity to change. And most people will, except the psychopaths. <laughs> Yeah, I talk a lot about uh, self-work uh, lately. Um, I just had on another person, Bernard Gunther, just before this show. I've been doing self-work for a couple of years now. Um, uh, who, you know, Lenin said, give me your child for four years to see that plant will never be uprooted. The Jesuits are one of the most nefarious groups out there, say, uh, give us uh, your kid for seven years and we'll, we'll show you the man. Uh, so, so much of that stuff is from your childhood and I started to realize I just got into hypnotherapy recently. Oh, I, I just, you know, everyone thinks they're okay. Uh, you know, like you said, when you were 30, you thought you were okay, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fine. Right. You're probably mm -hmm. not. Like, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, the more you work on yourself, the more you can improve your life and improve the lives of people around you. So I'm very into that kind of stuff. So if people are interested in what you're just talking about, I know you're going to be here for Narcopoco. So uh, possibly you can do a workshop on Narcopoco. Yes. Uh, we're going to tell people your website after this so maybe people can contact you if they're interested or, or whatever. I'd very much like to have people signing up before Narcopoco, make it possible online for people to sign up. Yeah, so we'll work on something like that. Cool. Um, and uh, Great. A couple other things I wanted to uh, take note of is, you know, we, we're in a, a group of people that believe in the NAP, you know, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, the NA, NAP is great, but it doesn't tell you what to do. The octolog is essentially the, the comparable idea to the NAP for getting things done. And that's, I think that's a huge tool that everybody should, should make themselves aware of. Yeah, it uh, sounds very interesting. Uh, some of the things that sort of resonate with me about the Octolog is I hear a lot from entrepreneurs uh, who are like, well, I've never done it before, it's kind of scary. Well, that'd be great if you could find eight people and work on it together, and then if you've never done it before, right? And everyone's got their own different skill sets. Exactly. Uh, so that sounds, that sounds really good. And, uh, 
uh, the, the, the whole thing about hierarchy, which has always been an issue with me. Like, I don't know how to respond to the, the more anarcho-communist types to say, we just got to get rid of all hierarchy. I'm like, well, how would anything work without, you know, you, there has to be someone who makes a decision, right? But this is interesting, and I have always recognized that, and I think as human beings, we work in small groups quite well, like the family unit. Right. So the family unit is generally, on average, three to or three to eight people, and on average. So that makes a lot of sense. But even when you look at things like government, if you have a very small government, like <laughs> like ten people, it probably works okay, right? Because everyone's pretty accountable to everyone else. But once you start getting up to 100, and then 1,000, then 300 million, forget about it, all things just a disaster, right? So the, a lot of this stuff makes a lot of sense. I know you want to uh, get more people involved in this sort of thing uh, when they come down to Narcopoca, which is February 25th to 28th, by the way. Uh, do you have anything in mind or anything that people can contact you on? Or? Well, I mean, we're, I'm going to be working with Bob here. and but. Yeah, you're certainly going to see me at, at Anarchapoco and, and probably some of the Facebook pages and stuff like that and probably uh, get a hold of me. But we're going to make Acapulco the breeding ground for the Octolog. So if anybody is interested in this kind of thing or interested in uh, you know, creating their own business or doing anything, Acapulco is going to be the place that we're going to, we're going to create this in, in reality. And then, you know, hopefully we can take that and scale it to the rest of the world. We'll have a model that every city, every town, every village can use to change the world. Every business, every school, every charity. You know, I, I, I think big of, dreams. I, I think, well, just think of <laughs> an octalog. Big dreams are good. If you told students how to, be, how to form an octalog, essentially, even in a crappy school, the students could influence the teacher to the point that they would say, you know, hey, I've got a question. And the, the teacher would say, no, you, you know, that's a stupid question. Well, then the other seven raise their hand. Hey, I think that's a, I think that's a valid question. You know, the, if you teach the children the octolog and the idea, they're going to start leading themselves instead of waiting for the teacher to tell them. And so I think, you know, especially the children, if they grasp onto this concept, it's going to be game over, you know. And so that's what I think is, is how fast this thing can proliferate. Once people start grasping it, understanding it, it won't take very long at all. I mean, and that's the thing with government. Government moves very slow. The octolog moves extremely fast. And so, you know, when people start seeing that their neighbor is successful, that their business partner is successful, well, they're going to start fun figuring out what, what are they doing? Yeah, that's one of the things I've noticed as an entrepreneur is when you have a small company, and a small company generally forms as an octolog, really. Like every company, like my internet company that went to $240 million, I started it, but the first sort of five to eight people who came in, we were working together like essentially an octolog. And that's how most startups sort of start up because right. you need a certain person, okay, who's a good programmer? Okay, we're all gonna work together. I'm not your boss, you're not my boss. We, we got this plan, we're gonna build something. And you see startups just go from nothing to huge so right. fast because right. you have that sort of thing. So I understand that part, it's really interesting. And you brought, out, uh, brought up about uh, you wanna make Acapulco the hub for this. And uh, I know there's so many people who want to get out of the U.S. Uh, you did, obviously, and you're very happy from what I can tell. Uh, Bob doesn't seem to want to go home anytime soon. I have no plans to go back <laughs> to the States. I like it here. I see wonderful things happening here, largely because of the talents of a few people who have wrapped their mind around the, the whole concept of the whole amount of octologues and run with it. And I've been looking for that for a long time. I've been presenting this information to the public in one form or another for over 30 years. And it's finally starting to come together as a result partly of I've become better at explaining it and I found some of the right people and you guys, this is, this is where it's happening. So I gotta be here. Yeah, I can tell you're excited about it. That's great. And as Michael mentioned, he'd like to see this be a hub for it. And I mentioned a lot of people want to get out of the U.S. A lot of people don't have a lot of money. There's this one person who comes over to your house quite a bit, or two people. Uh, Lily Devine, I think, is what she's called on Steam It. Uh, they came down from with $50 in their pocket. And they've been here for about a year. Yep. Uh, they're doing fine. Uh, they got a nice house. Yeah, they got a, a 
I don't know how they survive exactly, but they just get by. Uh, and they're kind of involved in what you guys are doing a little bit. And, and so they, I'm not saying to come down with $50. I think that'd be a little low. Uh, but, you know, $1,000 for sure. You could probably live a year easy in Acapulco. It's so cheap here. They, they actually got a pretty nice house, but you can get a, a little apartment for like $10, $20 a month. Yeah, it wouldn't be the nicest apartment ever. It can be. But, it, you know, it's fine. You know, if you're a younger person, you just say, okay, I want to try to do something. Maybe I'm interested in these octologues. Yeah, you could probably get down here on not much money. And we're also offering Anarchopoco scholarships, which is actually being sponsored by Roger Beer, who's an amazing individual at Bitcoin.com. Uh, I don't know tons about it. There's so many things going on. I can't even <laughs> keep my uh, eye on everything, but I know they're doing it. I don't know where you apply or anything. I think if you go on Facebook, you look at Narcopoco scholarships. Uh, so they'll be paying for some of the expenses or whatever for younger people. I think it's under 25. Under, under 25, uh, people can get their airfare paid for to, to Acapulco. And then I guess and Acapulco is giving them free tickets so they can... Uh, yeah, of course, down. that's that's for sure. And uh, a lot of people are actually coming down from the U.S. One guy's sailing down, Michael uh, Fielding of Sailboat Diaries. I think he's sailing down from the San Diego area. I don't know how many people can fit on his boat or if he wants many people mm -hmm. on his boat. Uh, there's also a caravan of people, I think, coming from Austin, Texas. Uh, so we're going to be uh, featuring a lot of that. Just check out Narcopoco.com, sign up to the blog, and we'll be putting out all this information. Uh, and uh, so you can find ways just to get down here and, and try to get involved in these sort of things. Absolutely. And uh, Bob, you've got a website, so if people want to contact you. Uh, right. My website is, actually one of my websites, is called titanians.org. T-I-T-A-N-I-A-N-S, it's plural, titanians.org. Uh, <clears throat> I particularly recommend beginners to go there and read the article that is called Ethics, Law, and Government. That article is the, of all the articles, there's about a hundred articles on the website now, and that's the one that is the best, simplest overview of the whole program, the thing we call the Titania Project. I also want to add one other thing, since you have uh, recently gotten interested in work on yourself, I want to say a little bit more about the soul bonding. Uh, there are six different technologies involved. Cognitive therapy, which some people just call talk therapy, is the least effective, but it does have some trickle-down effect because it happens at the conscious level and then some of that trickles down to the subconscious level and takes effect. It does, nothing takes effect in us until it gets to the subconscious. That's where all the real action happens. But we also have Gestalt therapy, as invented by Fritz Perls. We have strategic therapy, invented by Jay Haley. We have bioenergetic therapy as exemplified by the work of Alexander Lowen and we have neuro-linguistic programming and Ericksonian hypnosis and we combine, I combine all of those sometimes using as many as three of them at the same time. To my knowledge, no one else does that and if you want to be in a position to put yourself out as someone who can help others to sort their lives out you can come and learn to do that. We have, we're gonna have a training program, an ongoing training program. We'll kick it off with a couple of workshops, but beyond that, we're gonna have a group that meets every week. Or, let's say you have a group somewhere else, maybe this group in Puerto Vallarta, maybe a group somewhere in the States, and you have some uh, group that really wants to make use of this technology and wants to learn it so that they can offer it to others. Well, you put a group together and you can fly me to whatever city you're located in and once a month I'll come and give a weekend long workshop to learn how to do it because you don't need anyone's permission. You don't need a degree, you don't need a license, you don't need anything but the knowledge and experience. And we can provide that. And that's one of the things that the Octolog is gonna be doing. So it's another whole dimension to this technology that I'm really excited about because it did a world of good for me and a world of good for my clients as a, in my many years as a psychotherapist. So I want to put it out there where anyone can learn not only to take advantage of it in their own life, but also to share it with others in a meaningful way. So that's another piece of what Anarchapulco and the road to Arcapulco means. 
Yeah, and there's so many things going on that whole week. It's like uh, the before narco book starts, we have the Dollar Vigilante One Day Internationalization, Internationalization and Investment Summit. Uh, if you're interested in finance and making money and uh, investing, things like that. Then we have four days of Anarchapoco this year. Uh, the final day is an all blockchain cryptocurrency day with people like Roger Veer, Trace Mayer, uh, Tone Bays, uh, Dan Larimer of Steemit, uh, Christopher David of Arcade City has created like a blockchain based Uber. Uh, so all these amazing people are going to be around the whole week. And Michael, you know, you, you've, I don't know if you came to the first year, did I you? Did, yeah, I did. You did, so you've come to all of them. So you know, it's just this amazing group of people come. And a lot of people stay for more than a week. They some stay for a month, and some a lot of people just stay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so it is quite fascinating. That we have things like uh, Adam Kokesh is going to do a uh, homesteading workshop. If you're interested in doing that, like what he's doing there in uh, uh, New Mexico, I believe. Uh, there's uh, Terry Brock's doing an entrepreneurship course. If you just really want to get into entrepreneurship stuff. Uh, there's a, 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 a Sasha Day Games doing a relationship course, Anarchy and Relationships. He's an amazing guy. You just want to be around him. Luke, Luke Rudowski of We Are Change, Change Media. If you want to do anything media related, uh, he's the guy to learn from for one day. Uh, all these things are kind of stuff that you would maybe learn 5% of in four years of college, <laughs> uh, seriously, yeah. and they're all happening. So for younger people out there, and I'm not saying this to sell you on it, because I, I, I don't care about that. What I care about is helping people. Like, if you're, if you're younger and your, your parents are like, hey, we saved up $50,000 for college for you, Come down to Anarcapoco for a week, you'll probably learn more than you'd ever learn in college and ask them to give you like 10,000 of it to travel the world for a year and you'll learn more than anyone I have ever known who's ever gone to college. So, uh, so many exciting things coming up at the end of February. Check it out at Anarcapoco.com. Uh, one last thing. Go ahead. Uh, Bob mentioned the road to Anarcapoco. We actually started a podcast to talk about, you know, uh, the Octolog and all the different uh, features of it. Uh, in the form of a podcast, and so that's coming out. I'm not exactly sure where we're going to release we're, that too. Yeah, we've got five five episodes in the can already. But uh, you know, people are kind of confused about what an all an octolog is about and what the benefits are and all that kind of stuff. We're going to do that, and then we're also going to have guests that come from different areas to talk about all kinds of different things. I think we're going to have one about peaceful parenting here in, in the future. But uh, we've had. Uh, two guests so far out of the five. And so uh, it's going to be in, a, in an area that, uh, you know, we're gonna to continue to talk about things in various areas for people to apply to, to you know, all kinds of different things. So uh, stay That's tuned great. for that. And you're on Facebook, so uh, Michael yeah. Nimitz, just look him up uh, on Facebook. So if you wanna follow, you'll probably be posting your podcast and things like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you brought up uh, Peaceful Parenting. That's another workshop. Uh, Dana Martin's <laughs> Unschooling uh, and uh, Peaceful Parenting workshop. But it's actually like a family camp, uh, which a number of people are bringing their kids down. Mm -hmm. I think a number of people who didn't even have kids yet have, have gone to her course because they just want to get around. Yeah, isn't that great? Like, uh, it's, the funny part is some of them go right after and go have kids because they're so excited they want to do it. <laughs> uh, Julia Chiransky, I'm looking at you. Uh, and. Um, so yeah, so many things going on. I look forward to seeing a lot of people down here. Uh, just uh, so many, just you know, world-changing sort of things uh, going on. So it's great, and uh, really looking forward to seeing how your guys' octolog process goes. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see how that develops. We'll and, be here. Yeah, we'll be here. you're just down the street. This is seriously the anarchist neighborhood. We're all anarchists here, uh, and uh, great. We enjoy it, obviously. Yeah. And the price of living here is just unbelievable, isn't it? It's crazy. Like, uh, Luke Rodowski was just here, and uh, he asked me how much I'm paying for this house. And you've seen the whole house. It's beautiful. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's about the same as he paying for his apartment in Brooklyn, a one-bedroom oh, apartment. Insane. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a different world down here. It's great. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Uh, if you like this video, please like, subscribe, share down below. And that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. Acapulco, Mexico. This is Anarchast. <laughs>